Welcome to the Global Roundtable organized by the Global Foundation for Democracy and Development and South South News. It's a pleasure to present to you today Mr. Riyad Mansour, Permanent Observer of Palestine to the United Nations and also Ambassador of the State of Palestine to Dominican Republic. Welcome Mr. Mansour and it's a pleasure to have you with us. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you. And as always, we'd like to present uh, the country of the invited guest to you just in a brief second. So the occupied Palestinian territory has the area of 5,970 square kilometers in the West Bank and 365 square kilometers in Gaza. The population is around 10 or 11 million people. It's divided between historic Palestine approximately 4.5 million people in Gaza and West Bank and a worldwide diaspora concentrated mainly in neighboring Arab countries. The major language is Arabic and the major religions Islam and Christianity. The population growth rate is 2.9. The population age between 0 and 14 years in 44.5 percent, it's a very young population, Life expectancy at birth is about 76 for females and 73 for males. Infant mortality rate is 15.2 and the fertility rate per woman is 4.5. The education has some very impressive statistics. Primary secondary growth enrollment ratio is about 85.8. .8. And the female third level students are 55%. The literacy rate is 99% and the unemployment unfortunately is pretty high at this moment at the level of 25.7. The GDP per capita is $1,367. The Palestinian economy is fragmented and is right now very much subject to Israeli restrictions. And much of the population is dependent, still dependent on food aid. Major trading partners are uh, countries surrounding uh, Palestinian territory. It's basically Arab countries and Israel, Jordan, United Emirates, China, and also Germany. Top export commodities are monumental and building stone, footwear, ferrous waste, articles for the conveyance or packing goods, citrus, cigars, cigarettes, olive oil, and its fractions. The forested area occupies only 1.5%, which is a big environmental issue. The Palestinian government is a hybrid of parliamentary and presidential systems. Voters elect both a president of the executive authority and a parliament. Mr. Ambassador, we would like to ask you to tell us a little bit about the history of your country, about the politics and about the present situation. Again, as I said, you know, I want to thank you very much for inviting me, you know, to be with you in this uh, roundtable uh, discussion. Uh, I am very familiar with uh, Fang Glory. I was in that uh, foundation in the Dominican Republic. In fact, I spoke one time. I was a, a panelist. And also I participated with President Abbas when he gave a speech uh, in Fang Lodi. It's, it's, it's a fabulous uh, foundation. Uh, it organized more than one uh, conference on uh, the issue related to the conflict between the Israelis and the Palestinians. Uh, and uh, we are very, very uh, grateful for such opportunities and for President Fernandez uh, for uh, trying to educate not only the population in the Dominican Republic about such complicated issues in the Middle East, but also I know that uh, the foundation is interested in spreading the education throughout the, the whole region right. because uh, two foundations, one in Costa Rica, for, uh, uh, headed by President uh, Oscar right. Reyes, yeah. and uh, the Fanglodi organized a conference in uh, San Jose, Costa Rica last year, and I participated in that uh, a very important uh, conference to spread the education about uh, the conflict between us and the Israelis and more importantly of seeking ways to find peaceful solution to this very complicated uh, uh, 
conflict. Now for us, Palestine is a well-known uh, country and area throughout history. In fact, you know, if one to go back even to the Greek historians and their visits to that region, they referred to Palestine as a country inhabited by people there. We are originally Canaanites and we are uh, Samite people as Palestinian Arabs. Uh, therefore, you know, we go back way thousands of years thousands. in history. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, recently, by recently I mean uh, during the last 100 years and as also a result of what happened to Jews in Europe, the Holocaust and the discrimination mm -hmm. that uh, took place in Europe, it created uh, a movement, a Zionist movement, which uh, collaborated with British colonialism because Palestine was put under the British uh, mandate after World War I. And they promised the Jews uh, a, a homeland in Palestine. That led to the beginning of this conflict. And the United Nations in 1947 decided that the situation that existed in Palestine when England decided to terminate its mandate would uh, be temporarily resolved through uh, you know, partitioning Palestine into two states, uh, one that became Israel and the one to be the Palestinian Arab state and Jerusalem and Bethlehem to be put under international administration for a period of time to make sure that these very important holy sites for all religions, uh, at least the three religions that, uh, you know, that we know very well in our region, uh, Islam, Christianity, and Judaism, until the conditions that led to the, uh, to the, to the, to, to the reason why that the two communities were unable to live together in one state, so that they proposed the partition. So, of course, the roots of the two-state solution is uh, one, one, one would find it in the partition plan, the Resolution 181, which was adopted by the United Nations. In this connection, those who played a significant role in allowing the General Assembly to adopt that resolution in 1947 were many countries from your region. So that you were connected to trying to find solution to the conflict that existed in Palestine from the inception of the UN and the inception of the problem through the partition plan. So that's why uh, uh, the Dominican Republic and Costa Rica were among the very early countries that recognized the state of Palestine as contribution in peace, mm -hmm. and also to say that as the countries of the region that played a role in proposing the partition plan, the two-state solution mm -hmm. in 1947, they want to complete this exercise since one state came into being in 1948, which is Israel, and now it is the time for allowing the other state to, re to reach its independent and therefore to allow the state of Palestine to become a reality and to become a member of the United Nations and therefore to say now this issue in which now there is global consensus on the two-state solution, while in 1947 there was no global consensus. Mm -hmm. But now there is global consensus, everyone is saying two-state solution, which precisely means that the state of Palestine need to, be in, to become independent because the other one has been in existence since 1948. Well, precisely talking about that, Palestine has uh, asked for membership at the United Nations last September. Has anything happened since then? How, what is your perception as uh, the permanent observer at the UN? Uh, what is the process? Uh, what are you foreseeing? How is it moving? Well, you see, our applica application is in the Security Council, but our application for admission is the end of a process that started several years ago. I just was alluding to the fact that the Dominican Republic, Costa Rica took the lead in your region and then 
a few years after that, Brazil, Argentina, Chile, the rest of the countries followed suit. And we thought that this shift in your region of recognizing the state of Palestine would influence Western Europe mm -hmm. to follow suit. And that is the last continent in which, while we have representation of uh, Palestine in the capitals of Europe, and some of them upgraded our status to a mission headed by an ambassador to submit the uh, credentials to the head of state. That's the case of uh, France, Spain, and many others in Western Europe. So that the process that we started a few years ago, that now, or now for a few months from uh, past, uh, reached the point in which more than two thirds majority of the General Assembly are recognizing the state of Palestine. Mm -hmm. We have mo now 132 countries recognizing the state of, of Palestine. The last two, Iceland was in December, was the first one in the West European countries, and the other one just last week is uh, Thailand. Mm -hmm. And I think that we will do the ceremony in New York because myself and the ambassador of Thailand at the United Nations both are authorized by our ministers to sign the documents for diplomatic representation. So this process created a reality in which two-thirds majority of the General Assembly recognizing the state of Palestine. Mm. The other process was the uh, submission by our government, government led by Prime Minister Salam Fayyad, of building the institution of the state during a course of two years, which that plan was introduced to the Europeans, to the Americans, to the Japanese, to the United Nations, and was received warmly, financed by these countries. Mm -hmm. And in August 2011, we've completed what we said that we will do of building the institutions of the state. And according to the World Bank and the IMF and the UN, in their reports in August 2000 and in September 2011, they in, they've indicated that the state of Palestine or the occupied Palestinian territory are ready to govern themselves in an independent state, not of an LDC caliber, least developed country, right. but of a middle income state. So therefore, if we have the institutions, <coughs> excuse me, of governing ourselves in a state, yes. and we have two third majority of countries recognizing us as, as a state, and the peace process is facing the difficulties and the problem that it has been facing, then the logical conclusion would be for the international community to institutionalize these facts through the recognition of the state of Palestine as a member state. That's why our president uh, in, on the 23rd of September went to the SG, mm -hmm. gave him our application, and we met all the criteria of uh, state and therefore admission. And the SG, in less than one hour, passed our application to the Security Council for having a recommendation from the Security Council to the General Assembly to recommend uh, accepting Palestine as a state in the United Nations. Unfortunately, there is no agreement in the Security Council to give a recommendation to our uh, state, mainly because the United States of America uh, is still of the view that only through negotiation between us and Israel, this issue will be resolved. We disagree with them on that. We say that we are willing to negotiate with Israel all final status issues, the six of them, borders, uh, security, mm -hmm. Jerusalem, refugees, settlements, and water. But our independence as an expression of self-determination is not for negotiation. We are not inventing this from, the, from our heads. When Israel declared its independence on the 14th of May, 1948, they did not consult with anyone, nor seek you know, permission from anyone to declare their independence. The United States of America in 1776, they did not discuss this issue with the Brits, nor they seek permission from them. They declared independence of the 13 colonies as an expression of self-determination. Your experience is the same. 
the experience of all countries or people who lived under colonial countries, they, the, the people exercising their right to self-determination would declare independence. That doesn't mean that the governments that would come into power, including us, will not negotiate arrangements with their colonial power or with the country that is occupying them. Well, so, so this is where we stand, and we hope that, uh, that uh, the United States of America and others will soon come to the conclusion, since the two-state solution is the end game, and since everybody agrees to it, then why don't we do it now as an investment in peace while we are saying that we are willing to negotiate with the Israelis before we become a member of the United Nations or after we become a member of the United Nations to negotiate all the outstanding issues which I have indicated. Well, congratulations to you and to your Thank government you. and to your country on all the progress that has been done. Uh, uh, regarding the United States, there has been some progress in the relationship in a sense that the status was moved to the Delegation General of the PLO uh, in 2010. Uh, do you think it has affected your relationships? Has it improved? Have you felt any change? And how? what are the effects of that well, upgrade? The, uh, this uh, upgrade was a small symbol uh, uh, step, but uh, our relationship is good with the United States of America, with the previous administration and the current administration. Right. And uh, we are seeking from the United States of America is just to play an even-handed role, an honest broker between us and the Israelis to help us when we face difficulties in the negotiation to come up with some uh, proposals to help us to uh, reach uh, agreement on some complicated and thorny issues. I'll give you two examples. The Quartet decided on the 23rd of September that the two parties should go back to negotiations within approximately a certain period of time. And that time that they suggested to us will expire on the 26th of this month. And they said that begin with negotiations on borders and security. Now, we've submitted proposals in the past and to this round of negotiation under the auspices of the Jordanians in Amman, uh, in which we said that we are willing to adjust the borders of the state of Palestine and the state of Israel uh, with approximately 1.9% of the total area of the occupied Palestinian territory and to receive from Israel areas from the state of Israel equal in size and value to whatever we will uh, exchange or swap. Now, the United States, of, with, with Prime Minister Olmert of the previous Israeli administration, we reached a point in which they suggested certain percentage, 6.7, we suggested 1.9, and an honest broker would, can come, we expected from Senator Mitchell, for example, when he was playing uh, that role in the past as the special representative of the U.S. administration in connection with us and Israel, to come up with bridging proposals. So that this way how uh, a third party can uh, play a, a positive role where we can reach an agreement on how we adjust the borders. And therefore, once we adjust the borders, then we resolve uh, uh, three major issues. One, we resolve the issue related to settlements, because when we adjust the borders, if there are settlements which are illegal mm -hmm. from the point of view of international law and the Security Council, if there are settlements that, are, that will be in their side of the border, then they can do in it whatever they want to. And if there are settlements, and there will be. On our side of the borders, either they will be dismantled or we will reach arrangement in which they would accept to be uh, a law-abiding Palestinian citizens. So that's with regard, for example, to the issue of settlements. Now also it would resolve the issue of water, another complicated issue between us and the Israelis. Now they're having this illegal wall, and the path of this wall is not the line, the green line between us and Israel of 1967, but 
it, it comes in certain areas about 25 kilometers in our region, particularly in the midsection of the West Bank, where 80% of our reservoir of water is there. So if the line is adjusted correctly, and not to deprive us of our natural resources, including water, then we will resolve the issue of water between us and them. And the third one, we would resolve most of the area of East Jerusalem, because all of the Arab neighborhood of East Jerusalem would be the part of the Palestinian uh, uh, capital, East Jerusalem, and West Jerusalem would be their capital. Then we will leave till the end of how to make sure that the holy city of Jerusalem inside the wall where the three religions are to be open for everyone and to have models of really trying to find a way of how it could be managed uh, as a city that belongs to the entire humanity and it should be accessed uh, by everyone. Right. And also the other issue of refugees. Now with regard, for example, to settle uh, security, we said we are willing to accept third parties to come to our side of the Palestinian side, 10,000 soldiers, 15,000 UN forces, combination of UN, NATO, Americans, all of them to be on our side, to give Israel assurances and that they will be secure, nobody will be attacking them. But we will not accept to have a single Israeli soldier to remain on our land because we want to end the occupation that started in 1967. So I'm just giving you examples well, thank of you. these negotiations. Thank you for that. We have many questions on also that uh, pertain to economy, international affairs, education. So uh, there is a question by Asuncion that talks about economy. Yes. Um, Mr. Ambassador, Ramallah in the West Bank is being considered as a beacon of economic success and as a symbol of economic development. What do you feel the key um, of this success can be attributed to and uh, can it be considered as a model for other regions, other countries? Well, I must say from the beginning that we live under very difficult conditions. We live under occupation. So we are not in total control of all of our economic, you know, uh, uh, elements. For example, you know, everything that we import that comes through Israeli uh, ports. Even they collect the taxes on it, they take fees for this collection and they give us the money at the end of the month. But in spite of these difficulties uh, imposed on us by the Israeli occupation, the Palestinian people are very resilient. We have high, uh, highly motivated, highly educated, and also we are grateful for assistance from friendly countries, uh, mainly from Europe, Japan, and even the United States of America and the Arab countries. Now, with, with these elements in, uh, in place, then one can see the uh, demonstration of the Palestinian people of being able to build uh, an economically viable state if we enjoy our independence. And I think the main attribute the biggest uh, assets that we have for building a very uh, uh, serious economy is uh, the human resources. We have the highest degree of educated people in the Middle East. We, the Palestinian educated people, were instrumental in building the economy of Kuwait, uh, Qatar, uh, United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, and others. So we have a huge army of well-trained Palestinians who are successful in all fields, experienced, and eager to build their own state. So if we become independent and we are given the opportunity, uh, I am sure that we will be able to build a very, very successful uh, state, economically speaking, and would be able, you know, really to, not only to serve our people in a better way, but uh, will be able to make a difference in the entire region. Thank you. Uh, Margaret has a question on your diaspora. Yes. Um, a according to the Palestinian Bureau of Statistics, about half of the estimated 9 to 11 million Palestinians live outside of their homeland. Um, so to what extent does the diaspora represent uh, development potential and how can it be effectively harnessed, do you think? Well, you see, our uh, diaspora historically 
played a huge role in uh, the economic viability of our people. For example, at one given time, we used to have about half a million Palestinians in Kuwait. Now, almost of that, all the teachers in Kuwait were Palestinians. All the doctors were Palestinians, the engineers, the what have you. And Kuwait, because it's an oil-producing country, used to pay, you know, uh, good salaries. So they used to send the Palestinians to their families uh, money. And now you're familiar with this in the Dominican Republic. Right. Have, right. Uh, so it's a big part yes. of our economy. You know, they, you yeah. have uh, two millions. Most of them are living in the New York area, and they send a huge amount of money. Remittances. To remittances, yeah. you know, and therefore that is a significant part of the economy. I'm just only giving one example. We have uh, close to 300,000 Palestinian Americans. We have close to half a million Chilean Palestinians who are very uh, powerful, very economically uh, uh, situated bankers, what have you. We have 13 senators in the Senate of Chile who are from Palestinian origin. Mm -hmm. So I'm just giving example. We are like the Jews. We are <laughs> scattered everywhere. And usually people of minorities who leave their countries because of political and economic reasons tend to be motivated. So when they go to the diaspora, between education, uh, uh, being involved in the economy, in the business, they tend to be successful. And they don't forget where they came from and their families. Mm -hmm. So I would say that uh, the people in the diaspora, the Palestinians, carried in their shoulders their brethren in the occupied territories for tens of years in order really to help them to survive. And that's also another reason you take Ramallah. At any given moment, you go to Ramallah, you will find 10,000 Palestinian Americans in visiting Ramallah. And contributing and, and, and participating. contributing to the economy. They own properties, they bring expertise, they bring uh, capital. So, you know, we have resources in that sense uh, because of the uniqueness of our situation. And I think if we have an independent Palestinian state, I believe that Palestinians in the diaspora will invest uh, immensely in building the economy of the state of Palestine, that would also add to uh, the, our economic viability. Uh, Mr. Mansour, let's talk about education and the great statistics that Palestine has in that area. Jamila has a question. Ambassador, as you said before, the Palestinian people are very well educated. And according to the World Bank uh, survey, 60% of Palestinian youth view education as their first priority. Could you comment more on how this has been encouraged? There is something amazing in our culture. Now, you take that we have a, a UN agency, which is a unique agency. It's the largest of its kind that looks after the Palestine refugees by the name of UNRWA. It employs about 30,000 Palestinians in the occupied territory and the other theaters of operation where there are Palestine refugees, Lebanon, Syria, and Jordan. Mm -hmm. You would find large families living in refugee camps, and they have hardly economic viabilities. But the culture in the family is education. You have to be educated. You have to get somewhere. And I can tell you very proudly that as a result of scholarships given to us during the difficult days in the 50s and the 60s, mm -hmm. UNRWA sent thousands of Palestinians on scholarships as you know, outstanding students in the best universities in the Middle East and in Europe and in the United States. You would find now many people who are very successful in any field that you want, they went through the schools of honor. I'm just giving one example. Mm -hmm. So therefore, we have this culture that education is a must. And even if you don't have, as a parent, money in your pockets, your relatives will help you to send your kids to school not only to finish high school, but also to go uh, to college. I am from a refugee camp family. Uh, my father came as an immigrant. He was among the lucky ones that was able through a lottery system to get a visa to the United States as an immigrant in the late 40s, early 50s. The most important thing to him as a family of refugees is to educate the kids. Now, uh, all of my brothers, they went to college, two of us with PhD degrees, one who is more uh, successful than the two of us with PhDs in the business field in the United States, in California. So 
for us, education is a must. Education would allow us to succeed. And that is, you know, is, is a huge thing in the culture among Palestinians. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. I have one last question because we have internet audiences. Okay. We have about 3,000 followers that follow our emails and video programs. And uh, Tom Kadala is asking the following. Palestine has two areas of concern that are potentially hampering the state building initiatives outlined in the Fayyad plan. It has exhausted its ability to borrow more credit due to a deficit. And second, it may have to raise taxes and cut public spending to reduce this deficit. Lack of access to credit while imposing severe austerity is very dangerous. For example, look at Europe. Would your honor please comment and provide insights on how other factors such as the Arab Spring may play a role to stimulate growth in the Palestinian economy? Well, uh, this is, you know, there, there are many questions in that uh, comment, good ones. Let me begin, you know, with what uh, our uh, government is trying to do. You see, for uh, a while during the last few years, we were receiving substantial amount of money, aid from countries that was, you know, uh, that entered into the picture of the, uh, uh, the economy of the occupied territory, particularly in the public sectors you know, that how many people would be employed in the government and, you know, the budget. Now, uh, lately, the government was receiving less uh, money from uh, the donor countries for many reasons, including the financial, uh, you know, crisis. So our government is reducing the, uh, you know, the, the budget in reliance on uh, outstanding, you know, uh, donors' money by about one billion dollar, which is a significant amount of money in our budget. So if you reduce dependency by that much, then you have to do two other things. One, you have to try to manage your resources differently, to try to increase some of your income to substitute right. for the money that you are not receiving from the donors. And two, you have to trim your expenses. So then one of the ideas that the Prime Minister is proposing that possibly to trim the public sector employees through programs of early retirement of approximately 25,000 people. And that is creating some commotions. The other thing he is saying that the, uh, the private sector people in Palestine, they pay 15% uh, taxes, especially the people who are rich. He is proposing that those they should contribute more by possibly increasing their taxes to take it to a 30%. Some of the discussion that you see in the campaign in the United States today. It's so therefore, the you know, of course, these, these proposals are not popular proposals. But if you want to have a serious government to try to deal with the issues that you are facing, with the global problems that are affecting us in terms of you know, uh, budget and uh, resources, then, you know, you might be compelled to go through these uh, measures and these proposals. And, of course, there is reaction to them. There is also reaction to the, to the rise of prices. And we, you might have some, uh, some reaction from the Palestinians, including some protests, strikes, what have you. With regard to the Arab Spring and how it affects the Palestinian people, we say the Arab Spring, which is rooted in inclusion, of many sectors of people in the Arab societies, democracies, transparency, and fairer uh, way of distributing wealth mm -hmm. so that not only a f small segment of the population to get extremely rich mm -hmm. and a huge segment of the population to get poorer. All these things are rooted in a, a system, or a more just system in the Arab countries. Although it is in the beginning stages of uh, dealing with these big issues and we hope that our Arab brothers succeed in finding, you know, a uh, good solution to these issues. But if the uh, underlying main assumption of what is happening in the Arab uh, Spring is uh, justice, the Palestine question is the biggest question of justice in the Middle East. Therefore, we will be in a better situation once the Arab Spring uh, hold its roots and produce results
to include larger number of millions of people to be part of the political system and the economic system, better, you know, you know more democracy, transparency, inclusion, not to have a huge army of youth, including college youth, graduate, without finding jobs like in Egypt. So if these issues are resolved in a democratic way, where larger number of people will participate in the political decision-making process and the economic decision-making process, I think that that will be great for the Arab countries and will be great for Palestine. Thank you so much, Mr. Ambassador. And I would like to invite Ambassador Francis Lorenzo to uh, pose maybe a few questions or make a few remarks. I know that you are friends. I know that you visited Dominican Republic. And so, please, Ambassador <laughs> Lorenzo, Thank you. it's your turn. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Natasha. And yes, uh, we were in October at the Mara UN in Punta Cana. The ambassador was the keynote speaker, and we thank you for taking the time to come to Punta Cana as well as today here. At the United Nations, uh, we have seen how member states, or the support that you have been receiving from member states, and we have seen how many member states during the second committee, the resolution that is introduced every year, have changed their vote. Uh, before, maybe they were not supporting the resolution. Today, they are supporting the resolution. And I think that uh, it has been a big win. It has been a major step. The fact that now uh, you, have, you are a member of UNESCO. But of course, it has a price. $200 million were withdrawn from UNESCO. Uh, but the question is, in terms of all the UN agency, uh, how, how, how can you translate what you have achieved for UNESCO to perhaps maybe see all the UN agency? And, and what does this mean? Because I know that a lot of negotiation took place. And there was a lot of it back and forth. And I remember many meetings that were taking place at the UN. But probably maybe you can walk us through in terms of how, what, 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 what this means and in, 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 in all the hard work that needed in order for you to achieve uh, uh, to be a member of UNESCO. Well, uh, thank you very much, you know, for uh, this uh, very important issue. And also thank you for inviting me for <coughs> that uh, very uh, important event in uh, Ponte Cana related to the UN model. Uh, it was fascinating, you know, and uh, I hope that we can succeed in beginning the first UN model in Palestine and in the greater uh, Arab uh, countries because it's, it's a huge experience uh, for young people coming from high schools as they get ready to go to college to really to be exposed to the global agenda with regard to all the issues, the political, economic, social issues that we deal with uh, at the United Nations. Now, with regard to our support in the UN, I must say that we are very grateful for the fact that we have massive support uh, for uh, the question of Palestine at the United Nations. It is not only because we are uh, good diplomats, and we are, as, as Palestinians. <laughs> but, uh, you know, the world has a high sense of uh, justice and fairness. And they see the injustice inflicted upon the Palestinian people. And uh, they reflect their support through this massive uh, positive vote with regard to our resolution. It is not true that the United Nations is the automatic immoral majority as one Israeli ambassador one time said in the General Assembly. It's in the contrary. It is the greatest uh, moral majority supporting just causes and our, ex our cause is uh, only one example. I'll just give you not only in the second committee, but in the third committee, this year for the first time in the history of the United Nations, the resolution on supporting our right on self-determination reached a record number, 182 countries out of 193 voted in favor of upholding our right to exercise self-determination through independence and statehood. That is remarkable. Now, of course, this support, as I said, that we work very hard on it. For example, with certain political groups, we begin the negotiation with them four or five months in advance. One example is with the Europeans. Because it is very important for us that all political groups to support our resolutions. The Europeans, as a major donor 
in helping us to build the institution of our state, we deal very diligently with their issues and concerns, and we try to be to try to find in a creative way appropriate language to address their concerns, but yet not to compromise the essence of our principal position. And we manage to succeed every year in finding appropriate language to meet these two concerns. And every year you succeed in you know, finding that language, you put under your belt uh, tradition. And tradition becomes so powerful that sometimes some extreme element, like in the European group, when they try to deviate from established tradition, would find it very, very difficult for them to take the rest with them, and then they will be forced to change their course and to join the great majority and to vote in favor of our resolutions. Now, it's the same thing that we did, you know, with UNESCO. Actually, our application for admission in UNESCO was submitted in 1989. And it ke we kept postponing dealing with it until the moment was ripe. And the moment became ripe in the year 2011. I mentioned our building the institutions of the state, seeking recognition of countries from everywhere. So when all these pieces were put in the right place and created that moment to become a member of UNESCO, we became a member of UNESCO. Now, after the 26th of this month, if there is no breakthrough in the negotiation, then we have many issues before us on the table to consider, including possibly going to the General Assembly for upgrading our status to an observer state, including joining other agencies, not only UNESCO, including becoming a state party to so many conventions and instruments so that we will be equal to others. For example, you know, I've been attending the three last meetings of uh, uh, climate change in Copenhagen, in Cancun, and in Durban. We are not a state party to the convention. After what we've done at the UNESCO, we can become a state party through just only a simple instrument of a letter to be signed by our president saying that we want to become a state party to the convention. I'm just giving you an example. If we become a state party to the convention, we will not be orphans anymore. When we go to Doha, Qatar, this coming November, December, for COP18, and if we are a state party to the convention, we will be a state equal to everybody else in dealing with the global issues that facing all of us with regard to climate change and, and the environment. And we want to shoulder our share of responsibility in dealing with these big issues facing humanity. We don't want to be excluded from these issues anymore. We go, we participate, but yet they tell us that you are just only an observer. We want to be more effective in our contribution to what, uh, how to deal with finding solutions to these global con con uh, issues. Thank you so much, Mr. Ambassador, and congratulations again to your fantastic diplomatic efforts and successes. Thank you very much. We wish you good luck to you, to your country, to your people, and thank you for participating in the Global Roundtable. Uh, we would like to give you uh, the book that presents Dominican Republic and will bring some thank fond you. memories, we yes, hope, thank you very and much. some information about the Global Foundation and what we do. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me and for this very stimulating discussion, outstanding questions, and I'm sure that your audience will benefit from it. Immensely. Thank you so much, Mr. Ambassador. We hope to Thank see you. you very soon. Inshallah. Yeah. <laughs> Inshallah. <laughs> So we have seen today uh, Mr. Ambassador Riyad Mansour, Permanent Observer of Palestine to the United Nations and the Ambassador of the State of Palestine to Dominican Republic. Thank you so much for watching Global Roundtable.